was Jesse Cosby? How did this amazing man from Alabama influence people in Waterloo and all around Iowa? This is the story of a little known hero with a vision to help his community and break down racial barriers in Iowa. Jesse Cosby was born in Alabama in 1907. His dad was a poor peanut farmer, and his family had to scrounge for food, often rummaging through trash. He enlisted in the U.S. Army and was stationed in France during World War II, where he played the bugle, playing Reveille in the morning. He was stationed in France. He used to uh, shine shoes for the officers. He would cut the officers' hair. In the segregated American army, Jesse Cosby faced the incredible irony of fighting Nazis and fascists abroad, and then returning home to the intense segregation and racism of post-World War II America. Here, you can see a photo of a black regiment arriving back home in Waterloo, Iowa in 1946, with the neighborhood celebrating their return. Jesse Cosby wasn't in this particular unit, his brother-in-law was, but he would soon arrive in East Waterloo, a place he would call home. Jesse Cosby and his niece, Phyllis Burdell, exchanged letters while he was in France. They used to write letters back and forth, and so she invited him to come live in uh, Waterloo. So that's kind of how he got started. Like the Army, like across the United States, Like all over Iowa, Waterloo was a segregated town. White people lived on the more favorable west side of Waterloo, and black people were confined to the east side, which was bordered by railroad tracks and industry. There, many black people encountered obstacles when trying to purchase homes. Segregated neighborhoods created limitations for where black citizens could live. On top of that, black Waterloo residents also experienced mortgage discrimination. Banks denied loans to creditworthy black people living in redlined areas, that is, those neighborhoods lenders deemed to be risky. This deprived black neighborhoods of the much needed loans to buy or improve houses and take steps toward a middle class life. While officially illegal today, people of color continue to face housing and banking discrimination. Despite these difficulties, Jesse Cosby was able to buy a house on the east side of Waterloo. Yeah, he bought the he bought the home on Cottage Street. Okay, and that's at that's at the house on Cottage Street, Jesse Cosby's old house. Many African Americans who migrated from the South to the North in search of better job opportunities faced a reality check once they settled into their new towns or cities. Jobs were severely limited for Black men and women. In Waterloo, Iowa, jobs offered to black men included the dangerous killing floor of Rath Meatpacking Plant, which was the worst part of the factory, or a janitor, or the demeaning job of shining white people's shoes. Black women were offered jobs as maids for white people. Longtime Waterloo resident Willie Mae Wright was turned away at the employment office in 1962. I went to the employment office and they told me they didn't take Negro applications. When she answered an ad for a secretary, she was told she could be a maid instead. I went to take the test for the secretary and she told me she knew a lady that needed somebody for housework. I could do housework if I wanted a job. Jesse Cosby found work shining shoes, just like he had done in the army. Yep, there he is shining shoes, yep. And then one of his customers helped him get a job as a janitor. Jesse Cosby began cleaning the Waterloo Recreation Center and immediately saw that white people were doing all of these fun activities that were unavailable to black people in his neighborhood at that time. He strongly felt that the black community members should have these opportunities too. He saw what was going on in the rec center and he, and he got you know African Americans uh, interested in learning how to play tennis and golf and different recreational activities that uh, they hadn't really been exposed to because, you know, back then the recreational center was basically for white people and black people didn't uh, really attend. So he kind of got them involved in these activities 
As was the case across America, black children weren't allowed to swim in the local YMCA pool. But Jesse Cosby wanted to change this. He actively sought ways to bring opportunities to black children, to bridge racial barriers, and to address inequality. For instance, he wanted us to learn how to ice skate. And that was something different for black folks back then. Uh, But he wanted us to learn how to ice skate and um, um, golf, you know, and different things that he wanted us to learn to do. Jesse Cosby was very much about community. He belonged to more than one church and began assembling an a cappella and a gospel choir. It was comprised of the young folks from all over. Different churches. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He directed the choir. They'd sing, and then the people would give them uh, refreshments afterwards. And uh, I mean, they'd be traveling, you know, way out into these white communities. They give them refreshments afterwards. And this was one of their trips uh, when they went with the acapella choir out to sing. So the people just kind of opened their arms to them and accepted them. Yes, that was a practice session. The choir traveled across Iowa and raised money for Jesse Cosby's dream, a recreational center for Black Waterloo youth where kids could do all sorts of activities, including square dancing. Square dancing was taught at the Waterloo Rec Center where Jesse worked, and he seized the opportunity to learn it. Ironically, though both Indigenous and African American dance influenced the creation of square dance, square dancing was a white cultural response to the more risque jazz music and dancing, and was pushed in gym classes and after school recreational programs across the country. Oh, see, there's one of those pictures like, what's he doing in there? (laughs) You know, it's one of those pictures like, okay. Jesse picked it up even traveling to Minnesota for training and became an exceptional square dance caller. You know how today uh, some people can rap and really rap good? Well, he was able to call that with a um, this special rhythm to it. Wow. You know, when he called that square dancing that got people so involved and in wanting to be in there. You know, he was just that good. Jesse Cosby's square dance calling was in demand throughout the Midwest. With no recreational center built yet, he brought square dancing to his backyard. Yeah, in the backyard over on on Cottage Street, um, he had built a patio. There was a patio there, and he'd call those square dances, and they just had a good time. He had a band, and they performed on TV. Yep. Yeah, have you ever have you ever heard of Fine Waldo? Fine Fine Waldo, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's right here in the middle. <laughs> in the middle somewhere here yeah keep going go up 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 oh right there right there come down right there yeah that's him oh my goodness really how yeah, that, that's square dancing in charles city for his community work jesse was recognized by iowa governor robert ray and received an award for his work with children and youth and he was even invited to the white house to call square dancing Wow. Well, as you can tell, he has a lot of interaction with, uh, you know, people, white people. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. He had the kind of personality that would allow him to go into um, the white communities and do things that others wouldn't do. And they, it's like they accepted him. As you see some of those other pictures, well, what is this black man doing in the middle here? Jesse Cosby's daughter, Beverly Cosby, who was only six when her father died at age 50 in 1957, reminds us that although her father had gained acceptance into some of white culture, he also experienced racism. Racism that went beyond being forced to live in a segregated community and having limited job opportunities. Now we're in Iowa and a lot of times, at least down in the South, you knew when people were being prejudiced towards you or had, you know, up here, people kind of kept it under, uh, it was kind of undercover. So, but I'm not going to tell you, I would be wrong in saying that he didn't run across people that rejected him or people that um, didn't like him simply because he was black. Looks like he's got a cigar in his mouth there. Yes, he does. Yeah. Did he smoke? Uh, Yep. That's what caused that cancer, lung cancer. Oh. In the early 1950s, he um, became ill with cancer and he moved my mother and all of us into the home on Cottage Street. Again, Jesse Cosby died when he was only 50 in 1957. 
But before he died, he gave his home to his sister, who passed it on to her son, Jesse Henderson, who lives there now. Community members, especially members of the a cappella group, established the Jesse Cosby Neighborhood Center in his name in 1966. Yeah, as I recall, he actually wanted to open up a center where kids could come, like a rec center, where, um, you know, the black kids could come. And of course, he'd open it up to everybody where they could play basketball or learn baseball or, like you said, square dancing. You know, all kinds of activities is what he wanted they weren't going to give money for them to just have a so-called rec center for, you know, sports activities and stuff like that. But they were able to get it going through other programs, you know, like the, you know, food program and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, they had to have a starting place. Jesse's dream of a rec center for youth didn't come to fruition, but it did become a center for the community, offering vital services related to food, housing, recreation, and education to Waterloo residents on the east side. He he was a community activist. He was really the only black square dance caller in the country. So, I mean, he was blazing trails back then. Um, and also setting, setting the tone with his acapella and his gospel choirs. Everything that he done uh, has made me proud uh, to know that he was that kind of a person. Mm-hmm. He looked at what, what he could do for the community. Jesse Cosby truly was a trailblazer. He was a black man from Alabama who fought for his country and then came to Iowa to fight for equal opportunities for his community. His legacy lives on in the memories of his family and friends and through the crucial work done by the Jesse Cosby Neighborhood Center. There is still a chasm between the east side and west side of Waterloo, but the work Jesse Cosby started more than 70 years ago, along with that of Willie Mae Wright and many others, is changing that.